Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Fixing the Soil Health Tech Stack Gathering for Action Conference and Hackathon. I'm Martha King. I'm the Vice President of Programs and Projects with Farm Foundation, and we are pleased to welcome you today. As a reminder, you can ask questions throughout today's session by entering questions beneath uh, the video. You can also chat with participants using the chat. So um, we look forward to engaging with you throughout the meeting. It's now my pleasure to introduce our session moderator, Drew Zabraki. Uh, Drew, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, the, <laughs> Drew is at, uh, the GM for Value Chain Insights and Interoperability at Semios and very uh, great partner with us on this project. So Drew, I'll hand it back over to you now. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks, Martha. Um, yeah, excited for uh, another great day. We had we have a really cool uh, series yesterday. A ton of information was unpacked. Uh, and I know many of you stuck around for the, the breakouts and the, the quick recap, but I know some of you had uh, to wrap up your day. Um, so I just wanted to share a little bit with you on, on some of the things we talked about, some of the, the high level items, and then we'll do a full recap there at the end and you'll of course get copies of all the videos and things near the end. But you know, some of the interesting things that, that came out in the conversation is just um, all the different protocols and procedures around soil analysis and, and how do we use this information to drive insights. And as we talked about the value of the insights and, and all of the, the future potential, the conversation um, also quickly went to like, how do we communicate the value of that potential as we're trying to encourage people to adopt these practices? How do we, uh, there was a gentleman that brought it up, how do we put soil health on the balance sheet and have conversation about that return on investment, knowing that much of that return on investment comes from the land itself, but there's a gap between the time we have to put that, the, those efforts and energy into our operations until that return comes back and, and how, do, how do incentives and, and programs help us to fill that gap. Um, and as we started to unpack that, there was a pretty vibrant conversation around data use um, and asking some difficult questions. Um, and, and what I really appreciated around the conversation of data and data sovereignty was everybody really felt that the most important part to maintain in that conversation is the trust. Right, the trust with our farmers and ranchers, the understanding that that we are not just showing up to collect data and soil, like we're walking onto their home, right? We're, to, we're, we're connecting with people and using information to drive decisions that are valuable and we need to be good stewards of that data. So that was really interesting. We'll have some follow on with that. There's so many more things I probably didn't even touch on, but I'm excited to actually get going today. We've got an awesome, um, uh, session here, which we'll talk about in just a second. But one of the things that I'm excited to do is, is, is introduce Aaron Alt. Um, Aaron is a senior researcher for, at Purdue University. Um, and before we, we get into the, the checking in on soil, um, on the soil data. Oh yeah, no, that is exactly what we're doing. Aaron Alt, there we go. The slides are all caught up. You're doing great. Uh, senior researcher at Oates uh, Open Ag Technology System at uh, Purdue University. Um, I've had the privilege of working with Aaron for a number of years. Our company is a founder of that center. We actually are also working with uh, his company, Clever, to integrate MODIS into our farm data platform, not just for soil, but also for, for tissue and, and water data. So wonderful gentleman. He gives a ton of time and energy uh, to industry. And Aaron, you've been working hard over there. We've got some exciting things happening. You're going to give us an update on what's going on with the hackathon. Thanks, Drew. Um... So yeah, the uh, if you guys remember yesterday, there was a hackathon kicking off, and uh, uh, there's been a group of folks uh, over in the hackathon coding all day yesterday. Uh, I, I went to bed about 11 last night and got back up this morning, and uh, it has been beyond all the expectations I had coming in. Um, well, I should uh, caveat it with, we're going to do a live demo later, and I think it's going to work. Uh, but but it, it, uh, it was kind of fascinating for me seeing half the people here I didn't know before the hackathon, especially kind of before we joined. Um, and so the idea that we're all going to get together as an engineering team and build something or build some things that are all supposed to work together and demo them, that was new for me. Um, and uh, so far, it's going great. Uh, this morning, I, I ran for the first time a single command line command that took all of the examples of, of uh, uh, input uh, soil samples from all the different labs and sources we have, one line, it got them all, turned them all into modus format and spit them all back out as a single spreadsheet, which was cool. 
um, <laughs> because otherwise that's a tremendous amount of work. The spreadsheet has standardized column names from the MODIS standard and things like that. Uh, and so I think you're going to be excited to see the, the demos that we have in the future. We were able to get HTML reports for these things. I mean, the, the teams are really working hard. Um, and uh, it's 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 just like I said, been more than I even expected it was going to be uh, uh, going into this. So hopefully we have a good demo. We only got 35 minutes and we actually have far more to demo than we can show in 35 minutes even. So that's a good problem to have. But. But uh, so that's going to be coming up today at uh, 1135, I believe, Central. So don't miss it. That's where we get to show what we did while you guys were over here talking to actually fix the soil health tech stack, our little part. So that's exciting, Aaron. Awesome. Very cool. Um, well, uh, we're looking forward to that later today. I had a chance to pop in there and it was amazing because there, there were names I hadn't seen. There were many different companies represented and I popped into the different tables and listened to just some really great ideas and great collaborations. So it was, it was fun to see and appreciate your leadership on that. Um, so uh, session four, here we are getting into the weeds of the healthy soil tech stack. And uh, we've got a great panel here today. Um, looking forward to, um, to what's to come. Uh, please do use that uh, chat and questions feature. We'll be checking that as well. We have a little bit of time for some interactions, so keep your questions coming. We're looking forward to that. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce Shauna Day of Colterra Capital. Now, Shauna, I always enjoyed your conversations, um, especially um, how you, you just break complex concepts down into pieces that, that helps me to understand what's going on, specifically with soil health. Um, you had um, you'd written an article, I, I want to say it was in Ag Funder, of course it was published on Farmers and Ranchers and, and uh, Ag, uh, Farm Foundations also published the looking through the soil health stack through a, an OSI lens. So it's just an interesting way of, of breaking that down. And, and I was hoping you could unpack that for us here today. And I think we have- You a, got a it. Yeah. You got it. So thank, thanks, Drew, for that nice introduction and great to be here with, with you and everybody else. So maybe if we can get that up on the screen. Perfect. Um, you know, <laughs> as I always say I'm a recovering investment banker, and so I have to simplify things in order for me to really kind of understand them and, and oftentimes using, you know, something like a proxy or a, a, a stack that I've seen in other in other ecosystems before. I use that and apply it to what I see in agriculture. And I will be the first one to tell you that um, my lens is always colored by communications, mobility, wireless, which I think there are a lot of similarities between you know, the evolution of that market and what we see in, in terms of the evolution of the ag tech market. So I, uh, I took that kind of framework and really sort of looked at how that might apply to the soil health technology stack. And you know, part of this really originated because, as many of you know, I publish market landscapes of farm tech, ag tech, food supply chain tech landscapes. And so I'm always trying to understand how the different companies, the different vendors, the service providers fit together and where do they sit in an ecosystem? Because so much of this is sort of incumbent on building, you know, strong ecosystems. So first and foremost, the OSI model is the Operating System Interconnectivity Model. I'm not gonna say anything more about it than that, um, but it is something that's used to really think about computer, computing systems and, and um, communication systems. And fundamentally, it sort of is comp comprised of a couple of layers, you know, picture a layer cake. You've got the physical layer um, sort of at the bottom, you've got network and connectivity layers, you've got kernel layers, um, operating system, uh, presentation layers, uh, uh, application layers. So really thinking about that in terms of how we approach, you know, the bigger picture was how we approach kind of monetizing soil health, right? So then I backed into that and sort of said, okay, where is the physical layer? You know, what is the measurement layer? A and being kind of very literal about that physical layer, you know, how do we measure things? What hardware uh, solutions do we have to measure soil testing, um, remote sensing, uh, infield sensing, et cetera? The, that kind of middle layer, that kernel or core layer, to me is really where a lot of the environmental science lives. And, you know, again, this is very much a technology stack, not a scientific biological stack. Um, you know, hopefully we can sort of apply some of these things to understanding those, um, those ecosystems, but this is very much colored by technology. 
Um, suffice it to say that kind of core layer, that middle layer is really dependent on calculators, models, soil databases, you know, all the important work that you're thinking about in this, in this couple day session. And then that presentation layer, which for me was interesting because a lot of the uh, excitement and enthusiasm and funding are going into this presentation layer, right? The transaction ecosystems, the transaction networks, um, verification, MRV solutions, how do you bring together farming data, you know, from different applications, farm management information systems, farm management systems. Um, and that's where I think the bulk of the, again, I'll say this from an investment standpoint, that's where the bulk of the sort of interest and excitement has really been. And my my sort of argument, I think, in, in setting out this, um, this framework and, and the write-up was, hey, look, we can't ignore the other layers as well because they're so foundational to that presentation layer. I think the other thing that I would just mention, and, and that's it's really sort of relevant to what you're you're working on here, is um what I had not appreciated until I had a lot of conversations with both scientists and technology providers was the complexity of these the sort of calibration requirements and the translation requirements. And I felt it was important to include that in this kind of stack as well. And that you can see um represented in the in the gray layers. That to me is one of the most challenging parts of, of you know, sort of, quote unquote, fixing the soil health stack is really an appreciation. And especially for a non-scientific person um, and people outside of this, this sort of particular um, subsector to really understand how difficult some of the calibration can be in, in bringing together these different layers. Sorry, that mute, that, that, mute, that mute button got the better of me, yep. Shana. No, that's fantastic. And so, so well put together. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, um, it, it's helpful for me also as you know, not a scientist to be able to see uh, that stacked up and how clearly it moves through the, you know, the sensing and ultimately through to, to the presentation and how calibration and interconnectivity really makes it all possible. Um, talking about interconnectivity, um, Andres Ferreira from Syngenta and also Ag Gateway, which is Ag Gateway is the home of the MODIS standard. You know, we're talking about interoperability and interconnectivity. Uh, the hackathon is leveraging the MODIS standard. He's joining us here today. Uh, Andres, you, you've been just an incredible leader in moving this forward and, and doing a fantastic job with this. I'm excited to hear more uh, about Syngenta's involvement in that gateway and the MODIS standard and, and just um, kind of walk us through that, if you would. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I'll talk about, uh, I'll talk primarily about the, the uh, the place of, of, of MODIS and Act Gateway, and I'll mention Act Gateway a little bit. There's a few slides I'll breeze through here, but um, we'll leave them in the in the presentation so that uh, folks can look at them later. And then I'll try to position this a little bit um, also in the, the bigger picture of the global standards uh, landscape. Um, so let me just dive right in. Uh, can you see my screen? So. First, of course, um, soil testing, um, no need to, to uh, discuss why that's important. But a number that we had been uh, discussing in one of those breakout rooms yesterday of how many, how many acres of cropland are actually using you know, variable rate technology based on a soil test. Uh, we didn't have that number yesterday in the discussion. And uh, the number I have is that it's only 30%. So there is a lot of opportunity there. And we can certainly um, increasingly say that we can't afford the error associated with using the wrong equation or of not using tests at all. So um, the idea of using soil tests to, um, uh, to drive decision-making and of standardizing the data uh, is an important enabler of, of, of principled decision-making in ag in general and, and uh, of soil health driven management in particular. Um, and the MODIS format was a, a really good candidate for that attention um, because it's got backing and adoption uh, from a lot of labs and, and most of the electronic, um, electronically exchanged um, uh, soil test reports uh, actually are using MODIS, at least last time I asked those sorts of questions. It's also easy to use now. 
it was it was somewhat difficult before because some of the formalities of of the modus um, of the modus work weren't clear and were considered a little toxic by some of the companies. So the license under which it was distributed was unclear. The governance of the underlying institution was a little unclear, and so forth. So after some discussions um, in 2018, we started the, the the move of bringing that into Ag Gateway, so it could be managed with the standard uh, IP and antitrust framework and have a clear license for distribution. And uh, since uh, over the last couple of years, we've been working on revising the the controlled vocabularies of of modus, which are very valuable. The 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 enumeration of the different um, soil test um, and, and soil health and plant uh, tissue and and water and manure uh, testing codes um, and associating clear and consistent semantics with them. Um, and we've aligned them with an international standard called ISO 19156. So we're publishing version two of that vocabulary. Um, uh, and and we're going to do several other steps that um, that will make those vocabularies readily available to um, everybody. And we can um, leave that um, that slide for your reference later. Then uh, Ag Gateway has been mentioned, right? And um, it's an industry nonprofit uh, dedicated to promoting the implementation of standards. So Ag Gateway normally doesn't create standards, it, it looks to implement them. We, we only dip our, our toe into actually organizing or creating standards where something doesn't exist. Hmm? Um, so the, the way that our gateway works is uh, participation primarily through companies, but um, other organizations can participate through uh, associate or mutual memberships and individual memberships also exist. And uh, finally, our gateway has a strong working relationship with multiple other organizations, um, uh, some of which um, uh, we work through um, to get some of our, um, our goals met. Um, collaboration happens uh, through multiple uh, forms. Um, in particular, we work in, um, in working groups and we have a collaborative platform that all the, the work uh, takes place on. Uh, going to the, the the meat of the of the matter here, we're talking about version two of the modus vocabularies. Uh, something that we did, and I, I hope you can see it a little bit um, uh, here. I resisted the temptation to make a lot of slides about this because uh, time is short. But what we've taken is the the different components of a of a of a test. Like what's the analyte? What's the um, the extraction solution? What are the um, reagents uh, that are used? What what what's the extraction ratio and so forth? And we've broken those all out into um, sort of orthogonal components, so independent things. And we're describing each one of the of the codes in terms of each one of these things. So that when you see a lab report that has one of these codes mentioned in it, um, you know exactly what that's supposed to mean. And, um, and the team has gone back and looked for the bibliographic references for every single one of the methods, except when it's proprietary and that doesn't exist, right? So um, you're gonna be able to, to look up for each one of these um, modus methods, exactly what piece of literature it was defined in and can go look it up and make sure that that's what you understand that method to mean, right? So there's a there's been a, a strong process of adding value to the initial version one, cleaning it up, removing the duplicates, mapping those duplicates to the new codes, uh, making everything be backward compatible and uh, so forth. And I'm of course readily available to discuss this in nauseating detail with, um, with folks who are interested. Um, my role in this group that did this in Ag Gateway, um, uh, uh, in Ag Gateway's working group four, which is about lab testing, was 
um, as it, it's it's a liaison. These are um, lab test people, and I'm m more of a digital ag uh, data guy, right? I in fact chair um, Ag Gateways Agri Semantics Working Group, and so I was there looking to translate that extensive domain knowledge they had into a systematic framework that would fit within the bigger picture. We'll talk about the bigger picture um, in a moment. So the, the start of that bigger picture is that there's a standard for observations and measurements already defined within the International Organization for Standardization called ISO 19156. And it, um, it defines an abstract but very elegant model for all the different things that are that, that form part of an observation, like when you, you measure some, some property on a feature of interest, such as a soil core, applying a certain uh, method. And that act of observation has certain uh, properties and it has metadata, it has a certain context, and of course it has the result in it, it's 42. Um, so what we did um, in the context of MODIS, which is also, um, compatible uh, with with ADAPT, the ADAPT framework that you might have heard about, uh, sort of format conversion framework that Ag Gateway has also um, uh, pushed forward, is all these different dimensions that I just showed you. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we explicitly set up correspondences between the things in, in uh, MODIS and in the ISO 19156 model, so that um, if you integrate with ADAPT, for example, or you integrate with MODIS, you have access to all these different um, things, right? So back to the even bigger picture, right? So um, in uh, you know initially back in the 90s, we were talking about precision agriculture as something that 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 was enabled by these new technologies like a GPS on farm machinery and variable rate technology and auto steer and things like that. Um, then, you know, as time went by, people started thinking about, um, uh, about optimizing um, things on the farm, uh, like the profitability or, um, um, and, and thinking about recording what they were doing um, on the farm and farm management information systems came up and, and and started becoming more common and 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 there was um the idea of starting to calculate things like um you know sustainability seal print and so forth based on data that you were collecting with machinery and all of this you know kind of broadly think about it and uh, as as digital agriculture and now time has passed and folks have realized that we're generally kind of in trouble you know um the world has gotten very complicated. We've got climate change, we've got input price volatility, harvested commodity price volatility, supply chain interruption. Everything's very messy, right? It's a VUCA world, as they say, um, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. So what are we expecting of farmers now in this messy context? Well, it's a lot. We're expecting them to make data-driven, um, uh, principled decision making, right? And, and, and we're expecting this not just of growers, but everybody um, uh, who, who they interact with, you know, along all these different value chains, right? And we recognize that this is a multi objective process where we've got, I mean, you know, the, 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 they're trying to balance their profitability, um, their sustainability, and their compliance with, uh, you know, the regulatory context and they're just keeping their freedom to operate and some of these objectives are mutually um, mutually incompatible sometimes right so <clears throat> that's the bigger picture of what we're wanting and it's really hard but we said that we needed standards you know that standards are essential for this the problem is that the standards landscape is a mess in, in smart farming and ISO is aware of this. And so they've created the Strategic Advisory Group for Smart Farming uh, to address these concerns. And um, what this group is, is working to deliver is a standardization roadmap that can help ISO approach this area. 
in a well-organized and orchestrated way. Um, both looking at existing ISO work, its structure of technical committees, and um, and other parts of that landscape. Right. I happen to be one of the two conveners of the strategic advisory group. Right. So have a very have a, a, a very um, uh, good awareness of what it's doing because I help lead it. Right. So the goals of the roadmap are to describe that landscape, to identify gaps where further standardization is needed, either within existing standards that can make them more smart farming compatible, or between different standards and the gaps that exist between the work of these narrowly scoped technical committees, were to recommend actions and priorities for standardization activities and publish the results, right? Um, so what's this got to do with soil health and, uh, and what we're talking about here? Right, this is the best part. So um, standardizing this lab test data is an important enabler of things that we know to be important, right? So soil health centric management in particular. Syngenta, my day job, believes this. At Gateway, um, an industry organization, among others that, uh, that we're part of, also believes this, right? Um, so, um, the the vision on, on that we're pursuing here is to uh, combine an act specific version of ISO 19156, which I mentioned is a, a very abstract standard. We've been working on an act specific version of this for about nine years now, right? And we're very close to finishing, right? Looking to combine this with the controlled vocabularies and semantics of motives which provides these contr powerful controlled vocabularies of methods and analytes and so forth, right? And to do this while maintaining compatibility with existing MODIS work so that we can remove barriers to adoption and give everybody who's been using MODIS a huge leg up on participating in, um, in smart farming, right? So <clears throat> aligning with this, um, uh, work is pretty massive a piece of work that's been going on for a long time, um, coordinated by Ag Gateway, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers that, that creates a series of standards and Ag has the authority to do so in the US. ANSI, which is the American National Standards Institute and ISO. Um, and those you know, strange codes are X632-2 and ISO 7673-2 uh, pertain to that ag specific version of 19156. It maximizes that global impact of the effort, especially since we can feed this into ISO's future strategy for smart farming and its contribution to the UN SDGs. So in short, what I'm trying to tell you that what you're doing here is part and can be part of something way bigger and impactful on a, a very global scale, right? So um, if you thought that what you were doing was exciting, guess what? It's a whole lot more exciting because it can impact, it can have a very broad impact, right? And, um, and we put in place mechanisms to have participation and transparency and visibility of what's happening in that ISO strategic advisory group I'll be happy to, you know, take questions about or, or discuss off off uh, line. So that's all I got. Uh, sorry to have taken a long time. Well, that was fantastic, Andres. Mm -hmm. That um, well, and and to put into perspective just how broad and far-reaching these conversations are across many different standards and, and data and data interoperability being essential to things coming together to really help that farmer balance all that they have. Like you called it out there, he's, he's got a lot of different things he's trying to balance as an industry. Uh, it, it's, it's, it's nice to see that we have bright people like you collaborating and leading the way in harmonizing uh, the data and the information so that we can, we can help farmers to access the insights, right? The derivatives, the things that are useful for them to, to use in the moment. Um, so that's fantastic. I'm sure we'll, we'll have plenty of questions. And I, and I also understand we'll be sharing out some of those slides here uh, as well. We'll get a link if that hasn't already been sent out. Um, so thank you for that. That was fantastic. Um, 
there's, uh, there's also an opportunity for questions for folks. If you want to put that um, uh, into the event hub, uh, you can just enter your name and put some questions up there. So we'll have a little bit of time at the end. Uh, and, uh, and Dorn, um, you also, um, you know, this is just a great segue talking about Lotus and being able to use standards and interoperability um, the, uh, frameworks uh, to add value. You're you're using Lotus or starting to begin to use Lotus, uh, the JSON adaption for your work with the USDA. I'd love to hear kind of how you uh, how you've leveraged that, and then also um, if you could share maybe some of your ideas for kind of the, the higher level, bigger picture of. You know, what are some of the properties that maybe you see um, as part of the, the healthy soil uh, tech stack? Well, thanks so much, Drew. Uh, first, I just uh, want to uh, just acknowledge this fantastic pa panel and uh, the opportunity to uh, and the title for this was to diving into the weeds. It's one of my favorite things to do and really appreciate the opportunity uh, with this panel and the discussion yesterday to really start to pull these threads together, which has really been a culmination of, I just want to acknowledge all the work that folks have been doing, not just in the last six months, but over the last uh, decade, really, to get to this point and really acknowledge folks like uh, Gateway and the work that's already been done and how important that is. And often it's been unacknowledged and we're at a point with new markets and so forth where all of that pre-work is really coming into focus. So I just want to really acknowledge that and that so much of what we're doing at Open Team uh, is really to build and amplify on the work and find how each of us fit together in this larger ecosystem. Um, and so I'll just note that, you know, a lot of what we're trying to do is find those standards that we can build on and version and build the community around, uh, you know, the, 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 the domain experts who really can get engaged to update them and make these standards not just uh, something that sits on the shelf, but something that's active and alive and something that we're active, that we're working with. Um, and so that's that's been very much uh, what what we've been doing with uh, with uh, the Purdue team and working uh, closely with uh, with that gateway to uh, to, to again bring uh, those standards in and embed them into our other uh, tools in the ecosystem. So what I'm gonna what I'd love to do, uh, Drew, is really you'll see some echoes both of what Andres was uh, talking about, but also Sienna's maps, and then uh, put some. Uh, put some examples uh, into how we're how we're both doing things today, but also a little bit how I see some of these pieces uh, uh, flowing together uh, that I think also reference the conversation yesterday afternoon in terms of how we build trust. How do we you know move through the mechanics of implementing a standard? you know, from the field into the lab into our uh, results that actually get shared. Um, so I'm going to do. Uh, so this will be this will be a, a little risky uh, live because I'm going to I'm going to actually do a full screen share and uh, show some some live demos a little bit, but in a Miro document. But hopefully you can all log your all, bravery. That's great. Yeah. That's so great. bear yeah. with me good. here. That's so uh, I'm going to you know just quickly. You know I think you all uh, yesterday I, I went through this briefly, but I'll just do a very quick recap that one of the main challenges we have is uh, the, that the data we're collecting on farm is a mix of both, uh, you know, soil health information has both management data, which is generally sort of private and enterprise data that has all these trust issues we were talking about. And but there's also this broader public agenda that we have for environmental data for moving from observate. This is very much what Sienna's a different view of Sienna's uh, sort of uh, uh, stack there from observation tools, remote sensing, agroecosystem models into decision tools, um, and then trying to maintain our data sovereignty as we contribute to that. Um, so just re rehash uh, that a little bit, and that it, in uh, the way we see this tech stack as we're getting into the weeds is this farm level detailed high quality information is the foundation for all the other uses that we see, and that high quality data increases the value over time. Um, and that we view, think that we should, you know, have a, an authoritative data at that level uh, that uh, uh, that's controlled at the farm level, but then can contributed. So, um, and just again rehash uh, a little bit from yesterday. But this ag gateway uh, modus expansion of electronically electronic delivery of lab results is one key piece 
of that stack. Like, a lot of that this work is based on that. All the different uh, calibration models that we're talking about, improving the quality of remote sensing from environmental markets, uh, all of these things really uh, depend on the quality of, of those protocols and, and enforcing uh, the standard operating procedures that Christine Morgan talked about yesterday is like, how do we actually then trend, move in the weeds? This is the weeds. Like, this is actually it. Like, the, not only the standards, but the, then the implementation of those standards in the lab, in the field. That's a lot of where we get into the weeds with the tech because that's, again, not just the standards don't just exist on the scientific side. That actually affects the architecture of what gets built. And, and then it gets into the architecture or the user experience of how we actually apply this in the field. And there are legal ramifications. So, uh, and how we build contracts on that information. And so that sort of sets up again the conversation yesterday, this slide that I, that I sort of skipped through fairly quickly yesterday, but this trust and, our and, and why we've really settled on this ag data wallet concept as being so important for things like MODIS data, because it has both, again, public and private, you know, the value of this is when we share it and we aggregate it. Uh, and having it electronically aggregatable and those standards and all the things that Andres talked about make that possible. It's really important to be able to create an API to that data, but also to be able to put consent management, like who gets to see it, how and in what form uh, is really important. And so that's why combining not just the soils information, but the ability to create groups with it, to support certifications, to link management data, to have different, your individual identity, the identity of your farm uh, attached to that as a, a really important concept. So uh, the way we've, again, this is, bear with me, because we're, we're I, I, I'm taking this title is like dive into the weeds here. So I'm, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, but I'll, I'll give you, I mentioned that it's not just the tech side that's necessary, but uh, uh, not sufficient. We have to build this social context, you know, the technical service providers that have the, the community support and structure to actually implement those protocols in the field. That's been a big part. We have uh, attendees here from Point Blue that are part of the fellows program to build the new a new kind of digital intermediary that fiduciary role we heard yesterday so that's really an important piece of the actual weeds of implementation the technical context is everything we were just talking about the tools and training that actually work and i'll just mention because this came up a lot uh, or at the end of the day yesterday in terms of data privacy and uh, and sharing and consent and uh, consent management uh, the building on the work like we're building with Modus, building on the work of organizations like Ag Data Transparent to create new data use agreements and certifications, not only for best practices, but the creation of contracts that are then, you know, technically enforceable, but also legally enforceable. So organizations that take that on are particularly important so that we can create this Ag Data Bill of Rights, these standard uh, these, these standard clauses that we can expect or ask for and enforce as we enter into these different, as we're sharing across different types of users, whether it be research or government or integration or with our trusted advisors or across peer groups uh, and be able to uh, work again from this individual level uh, and move towards attestations and uh, and the attributes of those observations that Andreas was talking about. Um, and then again, that has to be linked in with the standard attributes for land, which have their own uh, characteristics. So again, I, I make this point, uh, again, not to get off the tech, but that the tech, legal and social design that we're getting into here, when we're just starting with something simple like a soil health test, gets really interesting. And the weeds are really, uh, it's really weedy. But I think the exciting thing is that we've got the the talent and the organizations and the will and the market and the urgency to really dive in and start to uh, tease some of these apart. Um, 
And with that, uh, I will dive in a little bit to provide some more details of what the tech ecosystem, what's sort of currently where some of the work is already uh, that ecosystem is and where it's moving. And I'll give you sort of two main types of applications in terms of how we're viewing this is we have a number of these utilities that are that are sort of necessary to support the larger ecosystem that are moving forward. We heard a little bit about this yesterday uh, and things like hosting data standards are, are is like one of those core utilities. Um, but there's the question set library. This is about uh, storing the standard operating procedures as well. Reference data, uh, soils data, activity data, uh, management data, all in common both in terms of the ontologies, but also reference data sets for calibration. Those are important uh, services that place that organizations like the Linux Foundation and AgStack Foundation are, are, are viewing their roles as important. USDA, certainly where the Ag Data Commons can play more of that role. It's part of the active conversation. Um, also Purdue is, is playing an important uh, role in those conversations. Then we've got uh, folks like Digital Green and Regen Network and other ledger technologies in terms of the infrastructure for contract enforcement uh, and smart contracts data and so forth and data use agreement standards uh, and consent management systems with their farm stack program. Um, and then uh, the PharmOS and AgWallet is really about this translation layer of how we can import data from any management system any ag management system through a switchboard into a, a, a portable data structure. Uh, and that's where PharmOS and the work I mentioned yesterday with producer operational data system with USDA, uh, the vision for that is really to, again, allow for data portability uh, and allow for input regardless, again, enter data once, use it many times, whether it's you're entering it in uh, your choice of ag management system, whether it's granular or aggregable or uh, true Terra system or whatnot. Um, uh, and, and so, the, and we see those as sort of infrastructure to support some of the core applications in the, and this is, these are sort of that, that presentation layer that uh, 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 Sienna was talking about um, and the way in which the, the user experience for actually getting it in, getting the data in. And so we see, uh, digital intermediaries and direct entry through a common onboarding. This is sort of the common way in which uh, so the data portability structure uh, that um, and the RSI work and survey stack that uh, Point Blue referenced several times yesterday uh, is sort of one way to create structured surveys uh, to import, but there are also other, other uh, ways in which we can create that portable data format. Um, and then creating the these common standard operating procedures and field methods and data collection protocols. This is again another uh, version or another interface for how data can get into an interoperable system. We also see uh, work uh, that's happening in digital certification, not only organic certification, but other programs where data is entered for other purposes that can then go through the API and sucked into the common portable data structure. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of uh, give you uh, some of the other conversations that came up yesterday in terms of resolving claims uh, uh, mentioned that the data interoperability allows us to create and resolve different types of environmental claims through things like environmental claims clearinghouse. Uh, again, uh, but that was brought up a little bit yesterday. Um, and uh, and again, a, a key here to uh, to making this actionable is being able to connect uh, through different marketplaces, peer to peer exchange of information, both for benchmarking uh, and making agronomic decisions, uh, but also uh, increasingly connecting projects with buyers, uh, either directly, as we've heard about through things like the Climate Smart Commodities uh, initiative, uh, products that have attributes with soil health attributes attached to them, but also uh, funders and environmental uh, and environmental markets. So there's a there's 
types of registries that will require this level of interoperability to actually function. Uh, and so again, to be able to have a registry of that includes soil health attributes, we also require some level of common identity and data structure to be able to find one another, to have funders find projects that meet their needs, to have products, to, to have uh, producers create products that actually can be findable uh, by buyers, uh, whether that's in the supply chain or, uh, and likewise with, uh, with government programs and so forth, to be able to uh, mix and match uh, and uh, have better performance. So there's another, I will skip through sort of the, the governance uh, side of things uh, and give you just again, so this is very uh, sort of high level architecture, uh, but just to give you a sense that that's translated actually into user experiences uh, and generalizable data structures that can be broken down into, again, this is a PharmOS interface, uh, that can provide you uh, the all all farms essentially can be able to be broken into areas and assets logs people plans that can then that uh, that can then be uh, represented through an api in json structure that can be you can build any interface on this but that there is a way to actually begin to create a, a you know similar to modus and modus working directly with pods or with open team or with uh, farm os be able to create these portable data structures um, and again we're agnostic to specific branded platforms we our interest in open team is to identify those standards and find hosts for those standards and point to them so this is again where we're trying to uh, move forward but i want to give you a sense of some of the examples of this in practice things like survey stack a way to create custom interfaces for data entry that allow for that interoperability to pull in electronic soil health results and add that metadata and uh, with API support and be able to share that information and those different protocols, standard operating procedures through things like question set libraries. So you can build on existing data sets. You can see how people have done it elsewhere and build on those efforts to promote interoperability. And then ultimately, you know, moving towards, as I mentioned yesterday, this much more comprehensive uh, benchmarking tool that starts, you know, very much like what we talked about with uh, what we saw initially with the uh, reporting and benchmarking with soil health results from Cornell. Uh, your results result compared to whoever else you would like to uh, uh, compare them to, and. Uh, uh, whether it's and then sort through management practices, climate, uh, other specific indicators, uh, and dive uh, much more deeply into uh, those systems. So that all becomes possible uh, when all the weeds that we're talking about uh, come through. So I'm, I, I will pause there, uh, but just hopefully give you a sense in the weeds of this toolkit that the folks in the hackathon that we're using actively and that we're actively contributing to the folks working with uh, with the folks in the hackathon to as Andres I want to really emphasize like as he said this is very consequential the work is very much in the weeds but it has the potential to flow through and have these ripple effects that I think are really powerful across the ecosystem not in terms of just getting in reducing the data entry, but really starting to create a system where we can do <clears throat> multi-lab comparisons. We can do all the really complex analysis that have been sources of uncertainty for so long. We can do, we can ask one question on a research, uh, for a research uh, at, at a farm level uh, amongst a group of peers and have that same data used by universities, by, uh, by industry, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot that the, these standards really unlock. So I'm hopefully giving a little color uh, to the, the weeds. Um, and thanks, yeah, sure. thanks, Drew. 
Yeah, for sure. No, thank you, Doran. Uh, uh, not just the weeds, but you, know, you, you, you gave us a glimpse into the horizon and the promises ahead and, and some wonderful work that Open Team and your partners are doing, you know, especially, you know, I, I like what you said, it's, it's, it's rippling through the ecosystem. We have a lot of stakeholders involved in different contexts, legal, political, social challenges and opportunities. Um, so that was, that was fantastic. We, we also have some questions um, from the audience. Um, and I want to make sure we get to those. If anybody has a couple of questions, we've got about 10 minutes left before the break. So you can put those um, there in the, uh, in the event hub. Um, since, since you're here, um, Doran, uh, just a quick question for you. It, is the Ag Data Wallet live now? Is it available or is that something like when can we get Yeah, we're answer? actively onboarding uh, mm -hmm. sort of our, our beta version with our, our fellows. Uh, so we've, we launched the fellowship program this year to onboard 800 farmers into the Ag Data Wallet, uh, which they will be doing throughout this year, okay, um, cool. and so that's that again. The, the 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 core of the Ag Wallet is is essentially that identity tied through the PharmOS, uh, you know, essentially the a PharmOS instance that's controlled at the farm level. So that's the that's the prototype, uh, okay. but it is uh, and much more to come in terms of distributed yeah, right. hosting and identity services to uh, to add to the security and the flexibility and the services that come with that. It's fantastic. I'm excited to hear more. We'll make sure and include a link in the follow-up for all the attendees today to, to learn more about that. Um, also, a couple questions for Andres. Um, there was, um, well, first of all, you, you had mentioned um, I don't know if you can, okay, come off mute there. Uh, you had mentioned uh, the ISO Strategic Advisory Group, and that seemed like a pretty amazing group. I know some of our, our team members are, are in the threads and channels on that, but it looks like there's a lot of people, or like how many people are involved in that? So there's about 230 there uh, international uh, experts from 22 countries uh, participating in that right now. And yeah. from dozens of ISO technical committees and, and subcommittees. So, um, and it's growing. Um, we we had um, uh, we we had the the African con continent underrepresented, despite the fact that um, I I I I witnessed a spam like um, you know hundreds of emails going back and forth with the national standards agencies. Um, looking for experts that could join and they're, you know, had difficulty going top down. So we have uh, contacted organizations like the um, Alliance um, for the Modernization of African Agri-Food Systems, for example, and gotten experts from there uh, uh, that will join us and so forth. Yep. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. I, it's, uh, well, to your point, you know, the, the work we're talking about here today, um, to yours and Doran's point, ripples out across many sectors, and it, it has very, very meaningful. Now, uh, just uh, another quick question before we ask Shauna um, her thoughts on another item. Now, the ISO uh, SAG SF group and the development of IEEE standards and, and smart digital agriculture and IoT, this, I sound smart, this is actually Jennifer's mm -hmm. question, so let me read this mm -hmm. back. Are there any connections between the ISO SAGSF and the development of IEEE standards in smart and digital ag? Boy, that's so probably a question for Andreas, not for me. Right, no, it is It is for Andreas. Yeah, I was giving you the heads up. Your question is next. Sorry, I, I, I wasn't meaning to throw that one at you, Sean. <laughs> we got your question coming up now, Andreas. So, could, uh, um, so there's connections between the Strategic Advisory Group and, and, and several organizations. The first ones we've, we've, we've tried to nail down are with the, the folks that create the, the UDA standards. So the, the standards that are used as um, the, uh, that have you know, force of law or regulation. So like the International Telecommunications Union, so we've got a liaison with them. We've participated in some of their events. We're working out how, how to collaborate um, with the International Electrotechnical Commission, uh, for example, that does many things jointly with ISO. So um, they have a joint technical committee that uh, deals with IoT and uh, uh, the digital twin idea. So we've got the, the chair of that group um, participating in, in several of our uh, subgroups um, and uh, several IEEE members participate in there. I'm an IEEE member for the last 20 years or so. And, um, and I've also um, 
uh, been involved to some extent in IEEE events regarding uh, IoT in agriculture, right? And so we're looking to strengthen that. There's been some communication between IEEE and ASABE, the American Society of Agricultural and Biological Engineers that I mentioned earlier, regarding how to work together on IoT. That's been sort of ongoing for a few years and I'm, I'm a part of that conversation. So I guess long story short, yes, some of those liaisons take some time to develop, um, but but we're on it. Yeah, well, and it's it's about relationships, and it sounds like you're um, uh, you're not just building out the tech stack, but you're extending those relationships. And just really appreciate your leadership and sharing that with us today. Again, we'll we'll get uh, portions of your slides out to everybody with your your information, so people can mm -hmm. can reach out. Uh, thank you for that. And Shauna, yes, the question that actually maybe is a little more relevant <laughs> for you. Uh, question from Rob Trice. We were um, so the question is: Have you um, have you seen since you you did the last landscape uh, in terms of shifts? So what have you seen there, like vertical integration, player solutions, maybe movement beyond carbon, maybe more towards microbes? Like what sort of shifts have you seen since the last landscape? Yeah, definitely. So for the past uh, two years, since 2020, I've sort of done, in the USFRA report, we published one of the landscapes. Last year, I did sort of an internal one for myself. This year, I'm, I'm doing the same thing. And you know, even more so, I would say, than the ag tech and farm tech landscapes, I continue to have to rethink the buckets to look at where the players are really um, uh, sort of moving because there's a lot of convergence. You know, among the big guys, the input companies, the, the um, ABCDs, they're all looking at this space from a monetization standpoint, and they're integrating different pieces of it. We've got, you know, a whole sort of emergence of LCA tools, verification certification tools that I, I am starting to really think more about today. Um, so there, and then of course, I think, and again, I'll say this from the investment standpoint, we've seen a tremendous amount of fundraising over the course of the past 18 months in companies that may have been called themselves a remote sensing company, you know, two years ago, and now they're an MRV company. So there's a lot going on in that MRV space and kind of defining um, you know, what pieces of that different companies are trying to address is, is very complex. And I'm sort of yeah. scratching my head and stuck right now, to be perfectly honest, in, in sort of thinking about, okay, how do I want to represent the landscape? You know, not the stack, I think is, mm -hmm. the stack, I still think is, is pretty applicable, the framework, yeah, sure. but it's really the landscape of companies and, and who's doing what that tends to be uh, more dynamic even than the ag tech market, um, for me at least. Well, it is. It is so much, so much. Well, your landscape landscape uh, uh, assets that you produce are always so useful and, and the commentary that comes with them. You put a lot of effort and energy into that. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that. And, and, and just thank you to a wonderful panelist here. Great information. We got into the weeds. I hope everybody felt like they got their hands dirty here this morning. Uh, we are, uh, we're here towards the top of the hour, uh, and, uh, I don't see any other questions through. So I just want to maybe, uh, invite everybody to, uh, take a, about a 15 minute break, uh, go into that event hub. You're going to see the next session. We have to do a, a bit of a uh, wrap up. So, um, there will be about a 10 or 15 minute break to come on back. So just enough time, um, and uh, um, sorry, we have two minutes, so I'm not letting you out of the room because we have a last minute question coming in for you again, Shauna. Can you please, in one and a half minutes, spell out MRV? MRV, measurement, MRV. reporting, and verification. Measurement, reporting, and verification. Well, thank you for somebody asking. I was going to follow up privately because I should have asked that question. I thought it was a common one, but that's good. Measurement, reporting, and verification. Important factors there. So cool. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for the question there online. Everybody else, we're going to see you back here in about 15 minutes. Make sure you go to that event hub. Uh, uh, Morgan or um, Martha, was there anything else to, to wrap up the session here today? No, I think you covered it, Drew. So just return to the event hub and click on the view session for session five, and you can keep the chat going. We'll be posting Andres' slides uh, fairly soon here. So I look forward to seeing you in the